So in this series, I'm going to be reading stories and verses from the Bible and unpacking them, explaining the context, what it means, and how it applies to our morally complex and changing modern world. Someone has to. I mean, Christian churches aren't. This is the foundation of Western culture and the Judeo-Christian tradition. If we want a future, we have to remember our past, even if you aren't Christian. We'll be looking at Acts 17, 15-34, the altar to the unknown God. The Apostle Paul evangelized the philosophers of Athens about their idolatry. I'll be reading the New International Version of the Bible. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens, and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned with the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, What is this blabber trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set the day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about this resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on the subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them were Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Phew! That's a lot to unpack. You'll note the first two verses, Paul and his crew ran into some trouble with Jews hostile to Christianity earlier. So, Paul was brought to Athens for his safety, and is currently waiting on his friends Silas and Timothy. Just some, just some context. But, always in town, he might as well get to work and hit up the local synagogue and evangelize to the local Jews and whoever would listen in the marketplace, as was his modus operandi. This got the attention of the local academics, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers of Athens, who were like, Hey Paul, what you doing? Oh, nothing. Just preaching the good news about Jesus. Cool, cool. Hey, let's look at my place. And here we get to the meat of the story. The Athenians had gods. Oh boy, did they have gods. A phone book of deities for everything. God of the sky. God of the sun. God of the forest. God of harvest. God of love. God of the afterlife. God of pestilence. God of getting hammered. God of the kitchen sink. And God of having a god for every freaking little thing. But they know they're short of the truth. They're missing something. An altar lies empty. No idol could be constructed because nobody knows its name or its shape. They know they're missing something, and they don't even know what it is. That's because what they worship was made with their own hands. After accepting the invitation to speak at the Areopagus, Paul explains what's missing to the philosophers. Their idols aren't divine. They aren't even real. 
their fictional characters only given a semblance of reality by their imagery. Contrast God. Man didn't create God. God created man, and he is not unknown. They just need to find him, as they should, for according to Paul, the hour of judgment is set, and he has proven himself by the resurrection of the dead. Now the philosophers themselves, they invited Paul to speak not for wanting to hear Paul's message, but for simple, idle curiosity. As far as they were concerned, Paul was a backwater hick whose quaint ideas were fit for only heckling and having a laugh among themselves. The Gentile philosophers, Gentile simply meaning non-Jew, were ever in the pursuit of truth, but they had put so much investment in their lives and livelihood into pursuing the truth that they weren't particularly eager to arrive at it. The journey became the destination, they like window shoppers, enjoying the experience of shopping without the commitment, responsibility, or expenditure of buying anything. We know this because all they do is hear foreign ideas. They want to hear more from Paul, but he turned them down, knowing full well that they weren't interested. They weren't curious. They just wanted to debate more, to poke and prod, dissect and disassemble. The end result would have been the same if he took up their invitation, and the only thing he would have to show for it is his wasted time. They were given the truth already, and what they did with it was up to them. Besides, a few understood, Dionysius and Damaris among others. The problem with the philosophers was that the pursuit of truth had, itself, become an idol, and it would ultimately be their shortcoming. The truth that they sought was their unknown god. They wouldn't know the truth they sought if it stared them in the face with a big neon sign screaming, I'm here, pay attention to me. I know this because that's exactly what happened. It goes without saying that the pursuit of truth is by no means an immoral action. Please, search for yourself the answers you seek. Just be sure to know when you've found them. No window shopping philosophy. No. Bad philosopher. Bad. Very bad. The emptiness. This endless yearning. If symptomatic of people trying to fill their lives with the wisdom of man, it will always be found wanting. The wisdom of God needs nothing. No images of silver and gold. No additional deities to worship. It is filling and satisfying on its own. Fundamentally, there's a God-shaped hole in our lives. That's neat and all, but what does that have to do with me today? Good question. Even better question. What are your idols today? Oh yes, we have idolatry in a modern day. My channel's foundation is the understanding that belief in government is a religion, but is faith in government not an idol? Do we not regard the state with reverence and piety through which our problems may be solved? Absolutely it's an idol. There's also the idol of multiculturalism through which all our social problems would be solved if we just embraced diversity. Is feminism not another idol to be sacrificed to and regarded with religious piety and reverence? Environmentalism demands humanity sacrifice not sheep and goats, but industrialization and prosperity on its altar. And if you ask those who believe in population control, humans themselves, the country and nation is also an idol to be sacrificed for to give meaning to our lives. Statism, multiculturalism, Feminism, environmentalism, nationalism, all these man-made isms and many, many more. We try to seek meaning in, togetherness and unity, but only to find too late that those who worship at these idols are never satisfied. It only makes sense, I mean, you try replacing God and you're surprised you fall short? It's, it's this emptiness, this yearning that people are trying to fill why Black Lives Matter burned down Baltimore when six cops, three of whom were black, allegedly caused the death of Freddie Gray and demanded institutional state power, even though the prosecutor for the case against the cops, the city mayor, the president of the United States, and his attorney general at the time were all black, and that they still don't think they have institutional power. It's why you have socialist publications like The Atlantic putting out videos why recycling isn't enough and we should all eat beans for the environment. They're trying to fill a spiritual need through their idols, but they can't find it. So they have to double down, go further. We just need more of our isms, and everything will be great. But don't think you are exempt just because you disagree with these isms. God calls on all of us to examine our lives. We all have our idols. Know them, know what they are, and then cast them down. The answers you seek, well, just ask Paul. They aren't far away. But you cannot serve both God and the state. Also, why are these idols always trying to force us to do things? I mean, really, where's the leave everybody alone idol?